Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our Community Council webinar on caregiver role strain. I'm Stephanie Ishu, Director of Communications at EB Research Partnership. EBRP is the largest funder of EB Research committed to discovering treatments and cures for patients and their families. We have two presenters tonight, Ann Lynch Jordan and Andy Helgeson. Questions for Dr. Lynch Jordan can be forwarded to her email address that will be shown on her final slide. During Andy's presentation, you can submit questions and comments for him in the chat box on your screens and he can answer that after presenting. If any questions come up later, you can always send them to EBRP at info at ebresearch.org. With that, let's begin with Dr. Lynch Jordan. Today's presentation is entitled, Taking Care of the Caregiver. My name is Dr. Ann Lynch-Jordan. I am a clinical psychologist at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and for the last 15 years have worked as the primary psychologist in the EB Center here. My presentation will cover a variety of topics, including the general challenges that parents face when dealing with the daily needs of a child with EB or other chronic medical problems. We'll take terms such as caregiver burden and caregiver strain and define them as they relate to burnout from being the primary medical caregiver for a child with EB. I'll identify some of the signs of burnout, including when to be concerned that burnout is severe or persistently present to a level that requires professional care. I'll discuss various ways to cope and prevent burnout, but also how to handle burnout when it's at a more significant level. And again, identifying the critical symptoms for when to immediately seek a higher level of help and professional care. A family systems approach is an excellent way to think about how a child with EB, their family and caregivers function on a day-to-day -day basis. What happens to one family member impacts others. So the child with EB lives and is surrounded by a family who also is affected by it. That family is then embedded in a community and each community has its own culture and that culture can vary from town to town based on region of the country, size of the town, or other social and political factors. Thus, all members are impacted by EB. It may vary from each different family member, such that the child may have to deal with uncomfortable and painful procedures. The child has to deal with the reality of the difference of their appearance or missing out on activities that other kids their age can do. Parents, on the other hand, are the observers and see their child going through pain, often and at times inflicting it themselves when they must bathe, bandage, or lance a blister. And in fact, experience the emotional reactions of watching their child have a different than expected life and development than what they had anticipated. And certainly in all of this is the fact that the parent often becomes the medical caregiver. The challenges that patients and families face are variable. Certainly EB first and foremost is an unfamiliar diagnosis to most people. So when their child is born with EB, Many people don't know what it is, have never heard of it, and have no idea what the future holds. Unfortunately, EB, as you well know, is often unknown to the greater community. That includes the medical community, as well as just the family and friends that people live with. EB, like many other chronic illnesses, is variable. One child with EB is different from another. One subtype of EB is different from another. And that course of EB and symptoms and pain varies across the lifespan for one particular individual. So what that leaves is a great deal of uncertainty 
And as we know, all people being different, different family members cope in different ways with uncertainty. Much like other medical conditions that have physical impairments, the challenges for patients with EB and their families are significant. There are a lot of just daily functional activities of living that patients with EB may not be able to do. So self-care is often done with the help of others and typically that will be family members. Because of skin, contractures, and other types of mobility issues, dependency on a caregiver will be certainly intensive and long-term. And so even if a child with EB developmentally becomes able to assist and become more independent in certain self-care activities, this may either be delayed and not achieved at their typical age that would be expected, or not achieved at all, simply because of the characteristics of that particular child's or adult's EB. For these reasons, and because of limited knowledge and skills in available home health care and nursing services, families may not have access to the supportive health care services that would offset the burden of caregiving. Thus, family members become primary medical caregivers, not only in the early years, but for some across the lifespan. As in other chronic medical conditions, the literature suggests that mothers are often the primary caregivers for children with medical problems. And so, most of the research on caregiver burden or caregiver strain focuses on maternal caregiving. But, as we know, it has become recognized that being a female caregiver does not make a person more vulnerable to stress and burden. It is, in fact, the parent assuming the role of primary caregiver, the one who is solely or nearly solely responsible for medical care that is more important than the sex of the caregiver. Burnout is a term that is a multifaceted concept. There are many different components that contribute to burnout as it relates to caregiver experience. One of these is role confusion. Role confusion occurs when a parent wears too many hats and assumes too many responsibilities for daily aspects of care. An example would be a parent who serves both as mom or dad, the teacher or homeschooling instructor, as well as the primary medical caregiver involved in bandaging, bathing, and other medical routines. Burnout occurs when parents have little to no control over a situation. So despite wanting or having a desire for nursing help or respite care, there is no such help available. Unreasonable demands increase burnout. And these are when demands are extensive, time consuming, and just not possible for one person to do. An example would be in a two parent family being the only parent to address a poorly sleeping child for a series of months in favor of the other parent, perhaps the working parent, being able to get a good night's sleep to be able to go to work, leaving that parent with too many demands placed on him or her. Finally, if the parent themselves holds unreasonable expectations about their own performance, it can lead to burnout. In this example, parents may have very strong convictions about being the only one that can do bandaging, that other people are either too careless, too sloppy, too slow, or incompetent. In combination, any one or all of these can lead to greater caregiver burnout. And with burnout, the toll of caregiving is broken down into this idea of caregiver burden. The sheer number of physical demands, emotional demands, and financial aspects of taking care of a child that has a chronic medical condition like EB. As the burdens increase in number, in severity, it leads to caregiver strain or burnout. And that is the impact of having all of these burdens stacking up 
and this impact is multifaceted. Research has shown many specific aspects of life that worsen if caregiver burden is too high. Physical health has a toll with more health problems, such as persistent pain problems or just a general susceptibility to viral illness. Research has shown that caregivers with higher level of burden and strain show greater inflammatory markers and stress hormones in their blood work and report lower quality of health based on their own self-report. Psychological health is also compromised. Caregivers with greater burden or strain experience higher anxiety symptoms, persistent worry, greater physiological arousal, leading to agitation, persistent tension, or just a sensation of being unable to relax. Depressive symptoms can increase as well. This can be a sensation of having a sad or down mood or persistent irritability and just a poor ability to handle the frustrations of daily life. Family functioning is impacted by greater burden. Not only are anxiety and depressive symptoms experienced by the caregiver, but they come out in family relationships where there's simply little time to spend time with unaffected children or a spouse. And there's also little time to do the very basic daily needs that the household requires. Cooking meals, doing laundry, paying bills, the daily ins and outs of regular family life. Finally, research has shown that caregiver burden has an impact on financial status, not only the cost of healthcare services, bandages, and medical co-pays, but the loss of income from a primary caregiver who might have been working, but now stays at home to care for the child with an illness. When these burdens add up, signs of burnout can emerge. And burnout often has symptoms that are very consistent with what people might call depression. They include changes to mood and behaviors. I think it's important to note that all people feel burnout in some regard, either with a job, with a relationship, or when stresses have stacked up for the family. The difficulty with caregiver burnout is that often these demands may not be temporary, they are persistent, and these signs of burnout can lead to greater problems if not addressed and monitored. So signs of burnout include withdrawing either physically or emotionally from loved ones, stopping having conversations with spouses, not asking about each other's day, not having conversations about non-medical topics or about children or the child with EP. Losing interest in favorite activities so that even if they have a favorite book or a favorite person they previously enjoyed spending time with, this does not perk up mood or otherwise feel enjoyable. Certainly expected mood changes like feeling down, less happy, or very persistently irritable. Changes in some basic needs such as appetite, eating habits, either excessively eating or feeling very hungry, or more often losing an appetite and eating a lot less, perhaps even having weight loss as part of a burnout syndrome. Sleep can be impacted. People may feel very fatigued, both emotionally and physically, but sleep itself may be difficult to achieve either difficulty falling asleep, very restless sleep, or waking early in the morning. As we mentioned, the physical demands of being sick more often can occur with burnout, so that any viral illness that is the patient is exposed to or the parent is exposed to is then caught. And then in its most severe times, feelings of wanting to hurt themselves or the child they're caring for. There is no perfect time to seek help. 
it's often when you have the least time and motivation to do so that you need it the most. The benchmarks that I use for determining when to send a parent to a higher level of care or some form of treatment have to do with the level of distress the parent is experiencing and expressing, to what degree the symptoms are impairing their needs and their daily activities, and simply the number and severity of the symptoms they're describing. While any one person can experience some of these symptoms for a day or two, or even for a shorter period of time, it's time to seek help when mood is low almost every day and for most of the day. It's also a concern when extremely low mood has lasted for several weeks without stop and that pleasant activities do not perk up the mood or cheer you up in the way they used to. The basic needs are important, and if a parent is unable to take care of their basic needs, like getting adequate sleep, eating three meals a day, and drinking adequate fluids, that is a time to go seek care. And certainly the severity of negative thoughts are important. At any time a parent thinks about death or dying, in terms of feeling like they themselves don't want to live, or they want to hurt or wish their child's life was over, that is a time to seek additional help. Preventing burnout and caregiver strain is as important as responding to it. And that's first and foremost, making sure that the caregiver takes care of themselves, which is often the hardest to do because they are so focused on the child or the other person that they're providing caregiving for. These caregiving needs are basic, engaging in simple but important daily activities such as eating three meals a day, obtaining adequate sleep, drinking fluids, and finding small ways to relax, which can come in many different forms, from crafting, reading, video games, or even simply sitting out in the sun for five minutes. Being the primary caregiver, especially of a medically complex child, often feels and seems like the only or primary role that a caregiver has. Having small identities, even if they're very minor, but are not related to medical caregiving are important. This can, having, this can be having the role of a friend, a church member, or a neighbor, something that helps separate from, from the demands that consume most of their time. Caregivers often have difficulty both seeking and accepting support from others for very practical reasons in that people don't know much about EB or the needs, or for reasons that they feel private or unable and unwilling to share what's going on with them. However, we know that talking about or writing about the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that tend to become overwhelming when burden is great is as therapeutic um, as seeing professionals. And sometimes engaging in all of these care activities preventatively still is not adequate to cope with the extreme stress as being the primary medical caregiver, and that's when professional support is needed. These practical tips are common, they're common sense, they seem small, they can be done with or without the help of a professional, but often are quite difficult to do when the burden of caregiving becomes so great, and it's very difficult to do problem solving for themselves as a primary medical caretaker. There's a host of different relaxation techniques, as varied as the people who use them. Simple deep breathing techniques that could be done through relaxation apps, YouTube videos, or other such electronically guided technology can help with meditation. These techniques are helpful for falling asleep at night or even for just staying calm during typical parenting situations when you have a chanter Ming child 
or for situations that are much more distressing during the crying or wailing during a bath or bandage change when pain is significant for your child. Distraction is equally helpful, and this can come in many different forms. Simply adding music to a bandage change may be all it takes for a caregiver to have their mood improve and the ability to focus away from what they're doing. Conversation or even putting your brain on that beach separate from the task that you're doing may be helpful in keeping the caregiver calm as much as the child. Breaking down tasks into their small component steps can be helpful and taking many breaks between these steps. Far too often, people try to go as quickly as possible through the critical routines like bathing and bandaging. And while it does improve efficiency and get on to the rest of the nightly or daily activities, it also can be so fast paced and so intense that both the parent and the patient, the child, are so stressed by the end of it it ends up being counterproductive. And had the task been broken down, bandaging an arm and then pausing for a moment, for a break, for a breath, something like that may have ended the task on a better note than it started. What your mouth says, your brain hears. And so talking positively, both intern internally in the head and caregivers talking externally outside of themselves is important. These techniques, positive self-talk or something called a cognitive modification, changing those negative automatic thoughts that pop into a caregiver's head when stressed or upset are important. Finally, there can be quite a bit of soothing using five different senses. Some people respond to music. Some people respond to certain colors or flowers in their environment. Other people have soothing responses to touch, whether it's warm fuzzy slippers or a super comfortable sweatshirt, and others to food, whether it's coffee, hot chocolate, or some other soothing food they have as part of their day to perk themselves up. Senses and sensory distractions are helpful ways of also coping with the intensity and demands of day-to-day -day tasks as a primary caregiver. When these strategies work, they can be very effective, but sometimes they're insufficient. And when it becomes important to seek professional help, one style of treatment and therapy is called cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy can be done by a therapist, social worker, or psychologist. It focuses on negative thoughts, negative emotions, and behaviors that may be unhealthy, leading to many other physical sensations such as poor health, chronic pain, or sense of shakiness and agitation. Cognitive behavioral therapy, which is often shortened to CBT, helps change these unhealthy behaviors or attitudes that may contribute to anxiety or depression. It helps change the negative thought patterns that can persistently be present during depression and burnout, and it can help make emotions more balanced. Sometimes CBT is sufficient as a treatment, and other times severity of burnout, depressed mood, and anxiety is too much, and there's a need for some type of medication. Certainly, those types of medications reduce the lowest of lows when it comes to mood, and also prevent the peaks of anxiety. They often are best used in combination with CBT so that the medication stabilizes mood while CBT provides the coping skills that can help manage burnout, anxiety, and depression. And even outside of the formal therapy relationship, the role of social support and supportive therapy is huge. And this can be done very informally with church pastors, with respite care, with extended family members, or other members of the community providing support. In combination, CBT, medication, and social support or supportive 
therapy relationships can be so vital in helping reverse the cycle of burnout. Being the parent of a child with a chronic medical illness like EB is demanding and rewarding. It has many dimensions to it. And at any one time in life, burnout and burden can be higher or manageable. There is no right time or wrong time to seek out extra help. And it can come in many different forms, informally, through self-care, through self-management techniques and for, from formal professional consultation. I thank you for your time and attention and I'm happy to have any questions, comments, or feedbacks directed to my email address below. Thank you, Dr. Lynch Jordan. Next, we have Andy Helgeson, who is the Resilience Education Program Manager at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, Stanford. Prior to this role, he served as a bedside nurse in the pediatric ICU for six years and as the nurse educator for the pediatric ICU for four years. Andy is a certified heart math trainer, a Caritas coach, and is a student in the Compassion Institute's teacher training program. He has been engaged in various forms of contemplative practice for the past 20 years. Thank you for your time, Andy. Thank you. Is the uh, audio working for everyone? Or can someone give me a feedback? Yes. Great. Um, so I won't waste too much more time talking about myself. I appreciate that um, last presentation, and I hope that what I have to offer will um, really dovetail nicely off that, as it's going to be geared towards specific, um, specific personal resilience tools, and in, in, in one in particular that we have time to go through, and we'll practice together. I'm, at least I'm, I'll invite you to practice together. So. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, all right. So we're going to introduce introduce you to heart math here. Oh, actually, I can I can do the slides, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, so I don't think I need to tell anyone why this is important. Um, uh, the last presentation set it up nicely and really reflecting on your own personal experience of um, what your daily experience is as a caregiver. Uh, I know from being a caregiver in a hospital setting, um, you're, you're in an environment of suffering and loss. And so we're touched by that. And what, however we cope, we're all touched by that. So whenever we're thinking about um, really making time to care for ourselves, there's an element of self-compassion, which is, I like to think of it as um, you think of someone you care about in your life and think of that person suffering and how you would want to extend warmth and tenderness to that person or that pet um, and thinking of how might we turn that warmth and understanding toward ourselves uh, rather than ignoring our pain or flagellating ourselves with self-criticism. So this is a, a lifetime skill in my opinion and heart math uh, just offers us one way um, which I, I think is very uh, simple and easy to put into your daily routine. Sometimes it's hard to remember to do it but I think hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll have some clarity on um, how you might do it and, and the simplicity of it. Okay, so the, the word resilience is, is a big buzzword these days, at least in, in my environment. And I like this definition that HeartMath uses. We're thinking about our capacity, right? We have only so much time, but we can learn to build our capacity to have energy and sustain that energy in the face of stress, challenge, or adversity. And this is before, during, and after those stresses. We can learn to build that capacity. So the time stays the same, but we can hopefully have some juice left. That's the idea. Now, when you go into um, heart math, they talk about emotions in two ways, depleting and renewing. Not good or bad. And when you think about depleting emotions, what we're talking about is fear, frustration, impatience, etc. They're human feelings. There's nothing wrong with the feelings. But the thing is, they're depleting to your physiology, meaning things are going to happen in your body. If you, for example, I was in a state of depression for many years, um, and I was sick all the time because I'm, when you're in one of those states for a long time, you're bathing in certain hormones, uh, stress hormones, that result in you being unwell. So emotions are fine, but if we live 
in a depleted state all the time, we know what that's going to lead to. Whereas renewing emotions, they're not good or bad. We may like them more, uh, care, courage, tolerance, etc. They have neurochemicals that go through our body, which offset and regenerate those energy drains. So we have the longevity, uh, problem solving, creativity, intuition, and so forth. All the stuff that we would like to have in our life is, is served by all the time we spend in renewing emotions. So the idea of heart math in short and oversimplifying it is that we want to learn how to shift. We don't want to be a victim so much. We want to learn how to shift from depleting to renewing. We don't want to repress or deny our experience. And we want to honor the challenges, um, the heartbreak, whatever it is that we're feeling, that if, if we're in a, a period of suffering, but we want to learn how to shift and have some influence over our state. And what heart math is concerned with and measures is something called coherence. And basically, this means that things are in sync. Um, your immune, hormonal, and nervous systems kind of come together and think about those times in your life when you've been in, it's described sometimes as a flow state, where you sort of step out of your normal concerns and things are sort of lining up and clicking. You feel good. You're, you're intuitively responding to the situation uh, in a graceful way. And maybe these moments are few and far between. But I would contend that most of us have had some of those moments, even if we have to go back a ways to think of them. So that's coherence, and we want to go there on purpose. And heart math focuses on the heart for a very particular reason. One is the nervous system. The heart has a very complex nervous system, and when they've measured the amount of information going from brain to heart as opposed to heart to brain, the traffic from heart to brain, there's eight times more messages going from heart to brain than there is from brain to heart. So it's a pretty powerful um, nervous system that the heart has. And we know now um, and through the heart math research and other research that it's the heart that is sensing um, things intuitively before our, our brain gets the message. So it's a really important for regulating ourselves. And this graph here is what is meant by incoherence and coherence. This is what heart math uh, measures. Now, I need to say that you don't need to have uh, any measuring device to do heart math. They do have them. Uh, I make no money. I have no conflict of interest. Uh, heart math doesn't pay me. I work for the hospital, uh, Stanford Children's Health. Um, but it's good to see what they're talking about. So when you look at this graph, you can see incoherence and coherence. That the top one, incoherence, just kind of looks less attractive, right? And you can see the notes that it impairs performance and amplifies your energy drain. Your brain is not working well. So just think about a time when you're triggered, right? When you feel someone's pushed your buttons or some situation has pushed your buttons and your brain kind of goes out to lunch. You're, you're emotional, um, you may be um, struggling for the right words, you may, you may not be your best self, right? Now when we're coherent, um, when we're in a state of, let's say, appreciation, then you see this pattern here um, which promotes optimal performance and resilience. What the patterns we're looking at is what's called heart rate variability. Now, when we think about this, what we're talking about is our nervous system's resilience. So when you see that smooth pattern for coherence, what that means is, is that every time you breathe in, that line is going up. Every time you breathe out, that line is going down. When your nervous system is resilient and coherent, you're, you're fluctuating smoothly in responding to your environment. When you're incoherent, it's sort of like dra driving with your foot, one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake. It's really herky-jerky. Um, so what we want to do is be coherent on purpose, and then all the research has shown how, how beneficial this is. Today's just a teaser, so we don't have time to go in depth, but I think it's, uh, it's pretty powerful stuff. So what we want to do is go from depletion to renewal. And what we're going to practice, or I'll invite you to practice, is called quick coherence. And we'll talk through it first, and then I'll invite you to try it with me for one to two minutes, very brief. So when we talk about that coherence, any emotion or feeling that's uh, renewing can create coherence in your body, in your uh, nervous system. So it could be courage, honor, dignity, confidence, appreciation, care, love, compassion, any of these things. What matters is that you feel it genuinely. Now, you may think about I know I have some days where I can't think of much to appreciate or feel um, or feel good about. All that matters when we're doing this practice is that you find something to feel appreciative for 
it could be really tiny. It could be, I heard someone before a presentation once talk about that first sip of coffee and you could tell she was just savoring it so, so genuinely. That will work. It doesn't have to be grandiose, sort of save the world compassion. It can be anything that you genuinely feel appreciation or care for in your life. So that idea is even on a really rough day, what is it that you can access that you feel genuinely appreciative for? So here's the technique. I'm going to talk through it first and just follow along with your, with your thinking mind here to kind of get a sense of what it is, and then we'll actually practice it together. So step one is focus your attention in the area of your heart. Imagine your breath is flowing in and out of your heart or chest area, breathing a little slower and deeper than usual. That's it for step one. So we're not wanting to force the breath in any way. We want it to feel natural, and we want to just allow it to be a little slower and deeper than usual. You see a suggestion there to inhale and exhale for five seconds. That doesn't really matter. Uh, if you like to count, then that's a nice rhythm to count. If you prefer to just sort of watch the breath and allow it to be natural, that's perfectly fine too. So you'll know what works best for you. If you try counting and you feel more anxious, then throw out the counting and just focus the area, your attention on the area of your heart and just allow that breath to move in and out a little slower and deeper. So that's step one. Step two, make a sincere attempt to experience a regenerative feeling such as appreciation or care for someone or something in your life. Again, genuineness is the key here. So someone you love, a pet, a special place, an accomplishment, anything that you feel is real right now, that's the key. And these are the only two steps of quick coherence. So the quick steps, we're gonna do it together. I will um, lead us through it. Um, we're gonna do with that first step, which we think of as heart-focused breathing. And the second one is to activate that positive or renewing feeling. So. Uh, wherever you're at, if you have the capacity, if you're driving, don't close your eyes. Uh, but if you're somewhere where you can be comfortable uh, and you want your posture to be alert and relaxed, so not too tight, not too loose, and you may have your eyes open or closed, and just settle for a moment in silence for a couple breaths. Now focus your attention on the area of your heart. Imagine your breath is flowing in and out of your heart or chest area. And just allow your breath to be a little slower and a little deeper than usual. Now make the sincere attempt to experience a regenerative emotion such as appreciation or care for someone or something in your life. And anchor yourself there in that feeling of appreciation or care. So that when your attention wanders, because it will, you just gently come back to imagining that appreciation or care for something genuine in your life. And that's all it is. That's quick coherence. It seems very simple. It is very simple. And what you wanna do is try and think of ways, if, if this resonates for you, if you're interested, you wanna think of ways to practice in the midst of a busy day. This is one of the reasons I like heart math. Uh, I also teach meditation and have a meditation practice, but we're busy. Um, I'm very busy. Uh, I'm not comparing myself to anyone, but I, I'm very aware uh, modern life is busy. Being a caregiver is busy. So these techniques can be done with your eyes open or closed. And let's say you're washing your hands, or let's say you're stuck in traffic, or let's say you are doing a dressing change, I've heard that mentioned a couple of times, or anything in life that 
uh, washing the dishes, something that's routine, something that you don't have to use a whole lot of conscious thought and uh, effort to complete the task. That's a good time to, while you're doing that task, just start focusing your attention on the area of your heart and just allowing your breath to move a little slower and a little deeper than usual. And the key here is not a, a trying hard, but rather the opposite, just, just imagining with a thought, what would that be like to allow my breath to be a little slower and deeper? What would that be like if I could breathe directly from my heart or chest area? And then what is it in our life that gives us that positive or renewing feeling that we can access today, right now? And think about when you might do this in your daily life. Because anything, is, anything like this is a practice. If you hear a webinar about it and never practice it, of course it's not going to have any impact. But if you can find a way to consistently integrate uh, little techniques throughout the day, even if you have 30 seconds and you've done it 30 seconds once a day, if you've done it 20 seconds, a couple times a day, whatever it is, whatever you have, if you can tie it to a task that's simple for you, I gave some examples earlier, traffic, washing your hands, then this can create that shift that we're looking for. So here's the thing that's very interesting in heart math research is we're affecting everyone around us whether we know it or not. When you can measure, um, they have a device called an electromagnetometer. It's been around since the late 1800s. It measures electromagnetic fields. So of your computer or phone, whatever you're using right now to, to listen in, there's an electromagnetic field. Um, your brain has an electromagnetic field, as far as the device can measure, of about an inch around your skull. Your heart has an electromagnetic field about three feet around your entire body. Now that's a measurable field that has nothing to do with auras or anything that may or may not be real. This is an electromagnetic field and this is coming from the heart. And in that field, if we're feeling anxious, if we're feeling appreciation, if we're feeling anger, fear, if we're feeling love, compassion, that is being broadcast in that field in specific frequencies that are measurable. So even if we're an introvert, I think of myself as quite an introvert, we're, we're broadcasting our experience, our emotional state at all times. So we wanna think about what it is we wanna bring into our space. And just to give you an idea of the power of, of what this, this work might do, HeartMath has a few interesting studies. Here's one I like to share. They took 10 groups of four people, three people, they're the yellow people in your picture. The yellow people in the picture had some heart math training. The blue person had no heart math training and they said, hey, come on in, get 50 bucks to participate in this study. And all you do is you put on this little clip on your ear and just hang out. Don't do anything. Don't think anything or not think anything. Just hang out like you're waiting for the bus. There's not, that's all you gotta do. And then the other three people, when they rang a bell at let's say 345 Pacific time, those three people did a quick coherence or a, another heart math exercise like we just practiced together. And at that time, when the three yellow participants did the technique, their heart rate variability pattern became coherent. That fourth person, 10 out of 10 times, so in every single situation, 100%, their rhythm of heart rate variability went from incoherent to coherent every single time just by being in the space of the other three people. I love that study. I think it's really powerful. And you think about um, your intuitive experience of life. We know that we affect each other. We know that you can feel when someone you love is in, in a really in, uh, strong mood in any direction. We have a sense of that. We have a sense of it sometimes even before they walk in the door, okay? So thinking about how we might have some influence. We don't have control over our emotions, but how we might have some influence over shifting our state by means of these simple techniques such that we can show up more in line with our values. We might show up more compassionately if we can tune, because what we're tuning is our nervous system. When you turn, tune your nervous, nervous system in this way to be coherent, you have more flexibility to respond the way you would like to respond in a situation rather than reacting uh, in habitual stress-related condition patterns. So what we wanna do uh, fundamentally is, is plug those energy leaks that we're having when we're incoherent. And then that's gonna give us some of that energy back. That's gonna give us that capacity, give us more to do. Again, we don't have more time, but we can have more capacity to deal with um, what's on our plate every day. 
And I'll leave you with this slide and then uh, available for questions um, that I love from Marianne Williamson. I put this slide together before she was a presidential candidate. Uh, I like this definition of a miracle. It's a shift in perception from fear to love. And so when we have some ways to practice shifting our perception, shifting in this case also our nervous system, our emotional state, we have more capacity to move into being more loving, to living our values. So that's a very brief introduction to HeartMath. They have a pretty good website. Um, th there's resources where you can go deeper into it. And I'm gonna share the slides with uh, Stephanie so that you can refresh and, and look again at the technique if this is something you'd like to practice. Uh, I hear there's a delay in the questions, but I'm gonna be available till about four or until questions run out if anyone has anything they would like to talk about. Thank you, Andy. Are there any, if there are any questions, you can write them in the chat box. And as a reminder, questions for Dr. Lynch Jordan should be sent to her email address. Okay, the chat box is working. Oh, thank you. Um, We can give it a couple more minutes to see if anyone types and asks any questions, but if anyone has questions after the webinar, you can always send us an email at info at evresearch.org and we will get them over to Andy. One of the things I like about the heart math is that it's very straightforward. So hopefully this presentation was clear and um, I made it um, as as concise and clear as possible as something you can use. Um, we have a lot of power uh, in how we interact uh, day by day and uh, our habitual responses are very strong though. Our, our, the ways we, we tend to react with our loved ones can be very um, deeply ingrained. So. Um, the first step is often to pause when we know that something is, is pushing our buttons. So if you can find ways to notice in your body when um, uh, someone's pushing your buttons or a situation is, is triggering you to react in a way that you would maybe not be proud of, uh, learning how to sort of just catch ourselves in that moment with some self-compassion, with some gentleness. Um, and then uh, you can apply any technique. Heart math is just one technique, but it's one that I think is, uh, I've found in my experience to be quite effective uh, in shifting and giving us some more flexibility and, and, and uh, how we respond and then bringing us again towards a place where we can hopefully have more energy for the things we care about. Well, it's been a real pleasure. I, um, I'm not used to, uh, I'm used to being in a room with folks, but I appreciate very much all, all the caregiving that you do um, for those people in your life. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, feel free to reach out, as, as um, Stephanie said, to the team at EB Research. And I've also included my email in the um, presentation, which I will send to them. Uh, and you all can look at it as a PDF if you'd like to review anything. So I'll go ahead and uh, sign off and um, let me know if you think of anything later or anything you'd like to share um, from trying this practice out. Um, thanks, Stephanie, and thanks to everyone um, from EB Research. Um, take care. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We will compile the remaining questions and get back to you over email. Just so you know, EBRP will be hosting another Community Council webinar on Wednesday at the same time 
that will cover clinical trials. You can register for that on our website, abresearch.org community council. We hope to see you then and thank you again for joining. Have a great night.